Hi, my name is Josh Green, and I'm a professor in the psychology department at Harvard University. And today I'm going to talk to you about some new research using what we call epistemic cooperation to combat political tribalism. Uh, so uh, it's not an accident that we're uh, having this, this symposium on tribalism here today. Many of us have the sense that our democracy here in the United States and other democracies abroad are under intense strain and that tribalism, great animosity between political groups and cultural groups is an important part, if not the defining part, of the problem. This is not an entirely new problem, but it seems to have come to a head recently. But over the last 20 years in the United States, Republicans and conservatives have been uh, developing increasingly negative attitudes about each other to the point where on the eve of the 2016 election, and it's only gotten worse since then, uh, Republicans and Democrats, both majority, say that they have unfavorable views of the other party. Okay, well, so, as you've heard, uh, it seems that this kind of political atom atomosity is, is fundamentally a moral psychological phenomenon. And so I want to start with what I see as the beginning, the core of morality, and see if we can work our way up to at least a pathway towards a solution to the problem that we would all like to see solved. Okay, so we begin with uh, a parable that comes from an ecologist named Garrett Hardin that was told about 50 years ago, uh, and I think illustrates the fundamental problem of morality. So here we have a group of herders who share this pasture, and these are rational, self-interested herders straight out of the Harvard Economics Department, uh, and every so often they say to themselves, should I add more animals to my herd? And they think, well, more animals, more, more money for me when I take my herd to market, so that's good. What's the downside? Well, not much. They're just grazing on this common pasture. So all of these herders think, well, I'll add more animals to my herd. But at some point, there are more animals on the herd than the pasture can support. And then all of the animals end up dying, and everybody ends up being worse off. And this is known as the tragedy of the commons. And from my point of view and that of a lot of other social scientists, this really illustrates the fundamental problem of social life. That is, uh, Individuals, if they do what's best for them as individuals, if they only pursue self-interest, then everybody ends up being worse off, whether it's about sharing a common resource like a pasture or whether it comes to violence and using violence to get, to get what you want. The fundamental basic moral problem is the problem of me versus us. What's the solution to the problem? I would say that morality is the basic general solution that we have to this problem. It's what enables us to live together and to survive better as a result uh, of, of our common association. Okay, so let's dig inside the moral mind for a bit. I want to tell you about uh, an experiment that I did with David Rand and Martin Novak some years ago. We did the laboratory version of the tragedy of the commons, which is known as the public goods game. So we have, let's say, four people come into the lab. We can also do this online. And everybody gets $10 up front. And then they're told, and they're only going to do this once, they're told you can keep all of your $10 or you can give some or all of it into a common pool. Anything that goes into the common pool, we're going to double and we're going to divide evenly among all four of you. You get to decide what you want to do. Now, if you do the math, what you realize is that you come away with the most money if you keep all of your money. Because if you keep your $10, then you get your $10, and you get your share of whatever other people put in and then got doubled and divided equally among everybody. So the me thing to do is to keep your money. And the us thing to do, the thing that expands the pie the most for everybody, is to put all of your money in. You can do anything in, in between. And we wanted to try to get at the psychology of what makes people me-ish versus us-ish uh, in the following way. So first we had, uh, in one version of this, we had people uh, make this decision where they can just make it as, as quickly or as slowly as they want. And that's what I'm showing here. In this, in, in this particular version, a little over 55% of, of people, uh, sorry, people on average co uh, contributed about 55% of their initial endowment. When we told people, you have to decide quickly, you have to decide in under 10 seconds, then what we see is that cooperation goes up. And when we told people, you have to de decide slowly, you have to take at least 10 seconds to think about it, cooperation goes down. So what this suggests is that, at least for these people in this kind of context, cooperation is the intuitive thing to do. You push people to decide quickly, and they go with their gut, and they're nice. And if you make people stop and think slowly, they think, yeah, I'd like to help, but I don't want to get the short end of the stick here, so maybe I won't do it. 
Now you might think, okay, so what this means is that people are innately good or innately cooperative. But the story, as I'm sure you'd guess if you thought about it, is a lot more complicated than that. And I'll give you a version of this experiment that speaks to that complexity. So in one version of this experiment, we ask people, what do you think of the people who you interact with in your everyday life? Uh, do you trust them or not? And we divided people down the middle into the people who mostly said that they trust the people they interact with and the people who said they don't. If you look at the people who say, I generally trust the people I interact with in my daily life, those people showed a big effect of this kind. That is, when they decide quickly, they put in a lot of money. When they decide slowly, they're more likely to put in less. If you look at the people who say, you know, I don't trust the people around me, them, whether they go fast or whether they go slow, it doesn't matter. It's like their first thought is, I'm keeping my money, and their second thought is, I'm keeping my money, and so it doesn't really matter if they go fast or if they go slow. And what this suggests is that it's not, we may have an innate capacity for cooperation, but our experience of whether or not we've done well by trusting people or not trusting people or some people rather than others, this very much shapes uh, this very much shapes the way we're going to play the game in the lab, and we think this shapes the way people play the game of life more generally. And this is really illustrative of a more general pattern, where the way we solve the basic me versus us problem is with, intu with intuitions and with emotions. And here you can see the sort of two by two chart where we have positive emotions and negative emotions. You can think of these as the carrots and sticks that, uh, that drive our behavior. And we have uh, emotions that apply to ourselves to make us good cooperative herders. And we have emotions that apply to other people. For example, if you out there are not a good herder, then you will have my anger and my disgust. And a la Richard Rangham's talk, uh, people will be more likely to be, co to be, be cooperative, although some people may never get the message. But that's, this is the basic way, it seems, that human sociality and human morality operates. With intuitive emotions that help us solve the me versus us problem. But modern life is more complicated than the life of a simple tribe on a single, single pasture. So I want to give you my sequel to Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. So over here, let's say, we have uh, the, this herd. And these are, let's say, your, your communist herders. They have a single pasture. And they also have a single herd, one for all and all for one. And that's one way to solve the me versus us problem. Over here, we have a different tribe. These are your free market capitalist herders, right? And they say, we're not going to have a common herd, and we're not going to have a common pasture. We're going to pass legislation that will privatize the pasture, and we are going to cooperate by respecting each other's property rights. Um, a different way of cooperating. And you can have groups with different religions, groups with different rituals, different ideas about who's allowed to be a herder. Are you allowed to defend your herd with an assault weapon? Are we going to have collective health insurance for ourselves and our sheep? All of these questions about how to organize a tribe, groups can be cooperative in different ways under different terms. And now let's imagine that in, 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 with these tribes, one hot, dry summer, the forest burns to the ground, and then the rains come, and there's this lovely pasture in the middle. And both tribes look at this new pasture, and they say, hmm, nice pasture. Uh, and, uh, and they move in. And the question is, what's going to happen here? Well, one thing that could happen, something that happened a lot in human history, is that one tribe just murders the other tribe. But in the modern world, we have, to varying extents, found ways for different tribes to live together. And this is the modern moral problem. It's not a simple problem of me versus us, of being selfish versus being moral, but it's a problem of competing moralities, of different groups with different interests and different values trying, with varying degrees of success, to exist in the same space. And this is where we have a hard time getting it together, although we have had a lot more success than people give us credit for. So as Mazarin Banaji mentioned, our tribalistic tendencies often work against us. You can put people into groups randomly, and all of a sudden they'll start showing a bias for the me group rather than, the, uh, rather than them, even though these groups are, are based on almost nothing. Other research has shown that very young children, babies, are listening for native versus foreign accents and would prefer, for example, to take a toy or even to look at someone who has a native accent rather than a foreign accent. This is uh, inspired by a famous story in the Bible where uh, one group identified members of another group by how they pronounced the certain word, the word shibboleth, and, uh, and, and sort of used that as a cue to tribal identity. And as we've also discussed, you can see our tribal identities come through in our attitudes about things like sports. Okay, so how do we do better? I want to start by taking a cue from a famous experiment done by Muzaffar Sharif uh, in the 1950s. So he had this very simple and in some ways intuitive idea, which is that the source of conflict is actual competition. It is fighting for 
scarce material resources. If you want people to dislike each other, put them in a situation where they have something to fight over. And if you want people to like each other, well, you're going to have to do something different. So to test this idea, he created this boys camp in uh, uh, Oklahoma's Robbers Cave State Park was the name of the place. And he divided the boys into two groups. They self-named themselves as the Eagles and the Rattlers. And he set them into a series of competitions. And with perhaps a little bit of nudging from Sharif himself, as expected, the boys became pretty, the, the tribes, the, the Eagles and the Rattlers, became pretty antagonistic towards each other, often physical fights, ransacking of the opponent, bunks, etc. And at the end of the summer, he wanted to put his theory to the test and say, well, what do I have to do to bring these groups together? And what he did was he gave them a, a shared task. He said, Things like, there's this truck with food for the entire camp, but it's stuck, and the only way we can get it unstuck is if everybody, the Eagles and the Rattlers, work together to pull the, 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 the stuck truck out and bring the food to the dining hall. And so, boys, after doing this, uh, different kinds of these cooperative tasks, eventually those tribal identities melted away, and they were much more friendly towards each other. Okay, so it's a nice story in this sort of engineered environment. Um, but can we actually put this to work in a meaningful way? That's what I'm mostly going to be talking about today. But I just wanted to mention, this is not a new idea. It's not unique to Sharif, famous, uh, Al Gordon Alpert's famous theory of, of the contact hypothesis. Bring groups together under cooperative circumstances. They're more likely to like each other. The jigsaw classroom and education, seeds of peace, bringing Israeli and Palestinian youth together. All of these ideas are getting at a similar principle. And then in, in history and political science, the idea that trading partners don't go to war with each other. When there's mutual cooperation with mutual benefit, you tend to have less animosity and more goodwill. Okay. Now, you can actually think of this not just as a theory of conflict, but actually as a, as a theory of all of human history. And my favorite sort of exposition of this idea is in Robert Wright's book, Non-Zero, in which he argues that really all of human history, or even all of natural history, is the story of cooperation at increasingly complex levels, starting with cells joining together to form larger groups of cells that we think of as animals, and all the way up to the modern era, where we have, believe it or not, had a lot more peace than we have in the past, perhaps after hearing some anthropologists You'll believe it, but most people don't. Okay, so uh, this brings us to the present moment where we have a long history of shared prosperity, larger and larger scale cooperation with larger and larger benefits for a larger and larger group of people. But something, especially in the United States, has happened in the last few decades that has challenged that trend. So what I'm showing you here is a graph of a few different economic measures, uh, most notably uh, gross domestic product, and median household income in the silver lines and the green lines. And what you see is that from the early 50s to the early 80s, these two lines moved pretty much closely together. And then something happened in the early 80s where these lines started to come apart, and they've come farther and farther apart. And what this basically means is that the American pie has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, but a typical person's slice of that pie has not gotten bigger. And the, the effect is even more extreme for people who do not have a college education. And a lot of us think uh, that this is really the deep driving economic force behind the kind of tribal animosity that we see in US politics today. So how do you, how do you fix that? How do you get, how, how, what do you do when, when this kind of shared uh, prosperity starts to dissipate? So I want to now tell you about some new research that I'm very excited about. Um, I should say that all of this, this is unpublished work uh, that has not yet been peer reviewed, so you can take it with, with a grain of salt. But I think it's important to, 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 to Get these ideas out there. Um, and this is work done with my wonderful collaborator, Evan DeFilippis, trying to put sort of the, the, the idea of shared, shared benefit, shared prosperity, mutually beneficial cooperation to work in a way that's designed to address the problems of the present moment. So what Evan and I did was we designed a quiz game where we can have liberals and conservatives play as partners online. Uh, and the quiz is designed to create a kind of mutual benefit. So what happens? Uh, they sign up to just do a quiz game. They don't know that it's anything about politics. And the first thing we do is we have them do a, uh, an info sheet. So what's your favorite color? Who did you vote for in the last election? Where would you rather vacation, the mountains or the ocean? We give them a whole bunch of different questions. And then we say, OK, you've been paired up with this other person. Get to know your partner. You can. Uh, and then you take a quiz on the other person's info. So among other things, you know the other person's politics. In the control conditions, we have people paired with people who are like-minded, so Democrats with Democrats, Republicans with Republicans. But in the interesting case, we have teams, pairs, made up of a Democrat 
and a Republican. And once they've gotten to know each other, they're paired with a little chat box, and they get quiz questions, and they have to answer the questions together. They get money for right answers, they lose money for wrong answers, and they can register their private opinions, but they have to agree on a joint answer, and that's what's going to determine their payoff. And economically, in this game, they rise or they fall together. So in the first part of the quiz, we make it nice. We make them like each other, and we make them like the quiz. So we ask them questions like, what, uh, what, what state is Mount Rushmore in? And usually one of them knows. They chat about it. I think it's North Dakota. I think it's South Dakota. And they agree, and they you know, most often get those things right. And then in the second quiz, we, Evan did a ton of research to try to figure out what do conservatives know that liberals don't, and what do liberals know that conservatives don't that's not specifically about politics? So you're already laughing. You know where this is going. So New York, tell me, what is, how, raise your hand if you know the name of the family on the show, Duck Dynasty. OK, so we got one other choice. But I don't see a lot of hands going up. On the other hand, how many of you watch the show Stranger Things? Right? So we see a, a, a few more. Right? So we found, uh, Evan found, I should say, these sort of places where liberals know something that conservatives don't, and conservatives know something that liberals don't. But again, it's not about politics. And so we create this kind of complementarity where not only are they playing together, but they're likely to really benefit from and depend on each other. And then we ease into the most interesting part of the quiz, where we ask them questions that are not directly about politics, but where there's a strong kind of political bias. So an example question would be, what percentage of gun deaths in 2016 were caused by assault-style rifles. Um, so let me show you, uh, you know, the gun isn't normally there, but otherwise this is what you, 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 would, you, you would see in a chat box. So you get this question, what percentage of gun deaths were caused by assault-style rifles? The right answer is 2%. Most liberals seem to think it's a lot. They'll typically say 35% and congratulate themselves for not saying 56%. Um, <laughs> So here, here's an example of a chat between a liberal and a conservative trying to address this question. So the liberal says, oh, it has to be a big number. The conservative says, no, I remember it being really small. 2%? Ah, but what about mass shootings? And the conservative says, that's a small part of gun deaths. And the liberal says, OK, I'll put 2%, I'll agree with you, and I'll put 35% for my private answer, not, not the one that counts for the money. They get the answer. They learn that the conservative is right. And now you have this liberal cheering the fact that this conservative was right about guns and that he or she was wrong. Okay, so this is, this is the kind of, this is, this is what, we're, what we're looking for in this game. And the question is, after playing this game with someone from the other side, what does it do to your attitudes? Not just towards the person you're playing, but perhaps to the outgroup overall. Um, so we use uh, what they call a feeling thermometer. How cold or warm on a scale of zero to 100 do you feel about Republicans or do you feel about Democrats? Here we're asking about the outgroup for each person. And in the control group, you can see that these lines are flat. That is to say, before the quiz, after the quiz, the warmth, the feeling about the outgroup is not, is, it do, doesn't go up. They start out low and, 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 and they stay pretty low. But if you played the game with a member of the outgroup, then after playing the game, your feelings of warmth go up. And we see this for the Democrats, and we see this for the Republicans. And this, is one of the, this uh, side of the graph is all the participants. If you look at the strong partisans only, in some cases, the effect is actually stronger. So people are colder, and then you see uh, the lines go, in the case of the Republicans, way up. Uh, that is, the people on the far side actually show a bigger, a, a bigger move, at least uh, in, in, in this data set. Um, and while this is new research, we have replicated uh, th th this effect in a second set, this time only using strong partisans. So this is the, the flat lines for the control group. The, the attitudes are not warming up. But when Democrats play with a Republican, it warms up. When Republicans play with a Democrat, it warms up. OK, well, that's good. That's people expressing more positive attitudes with words. But what about something where you have to put your money where your mouth is? So another thing that we did in these experiments is we asked people, we say, at the end of the game, when you're done with your partner, we say, we're going to give you a dollar. And you can give your dollar to any amount of your dollar, all of it or none of it, to your partner. And anything you give, we're going to multiply by two. Okay, and, uh, and, and so the question is, how much are you willing to give to the other person? So to give you an idea of a baseline, in the order, an earlier version of this where there was no quiz game, no cooperation, we just paired, say, two conservatives together online and did the dollar thing, they'll give about 40 cents on the dollar on average. For Democrats uh, paired with each other, in this sample at least, they have 60 cents on the dollar uh, on, on average. That's not the main point. You're all snickering. Uh, the main point is this. What happens after people play the game 
either with an outgroup partner or with an in-group partner. And what we see so far is that the game is special sauce. You pour it on and it makes everybody nice to everybody, regardless of whether or not you're play you played with somebody on, on an outgroup or in-group. Statistically, these are all the same and they're all much higher. Or to put this in the most dramatic terms, a Republican who just played with a Democratic partner will give almost twice as much to that Democrat than the Republican would have given to a fellow Republican without playing the game. So the game, cooperating with that individual, just swamps the effect of, of, of politics. Politics goes out the window, and you're just thinking about this person who you cooperated with. OK, but that's a feeling about the person you just played with. But for this to really do something in terms of society, you, know, you can't have everybody play with everybody. Is this going to spread to the group overall? And so uh, in the most recent version, we said, you have a dollar, and you can divide it between some other Democrat and some other Republican online. So what happens there in our control conditions where you have Democrats who play with Democrats and then are asked about giving to a random Republican, or Republicans who are played with other Republicans and are asked to, about giving to a random Democrat, you can see where the levels are. But if you played with an outgroup partner, then you're more likely to give more, to get closer to equality with some other person from the other group, not someone who, who you played with. And this is putting your money with your, where your mouth is. And this, this experiment was done only with people who identified themselves as strong partisans. So this is not just cherry picking the, the warm and fuzzies uh, when it comes to, to intertribal attitudes. So it seems like having this kind of experience can change your attitude towards the outgroup and in a way where, 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 where it involves a real, uh, a, a real cost and a real benefit. Um, I just want to show you, just to give you an example, because this is done online, and you might think that it's this very stilted, weird environment. And, and in, in a sense, it's very unnatural. But I want to show you just how sort of real these human interactions are. So this is not a typical case. This is a 50-year-old black professor who describes himself as extremely conservative, maybe not what you'd expect, and then a 32-year-old white male who is also a little person. Uh, and they're getting this question about what, what percentage of pediatricians believe that exposure to violent video games increases the level of aggression in children. So our conservative says, Halo Infinite Baby, that's referring to the violent video game, Halo, uh, and then the liberal says, boy. Uh, so 90, they're pretty prissy when it comes to most everything. Prissy equals safe, then call me prissy, or should I call you doctor? They're palling around. Uh, top right has a running total of the bonus. They get the answer, they find out that they're right, uh, and our conservative uh, says, boom, we are goddamn warriors murdering this game. <laughs> Laughing my friendly ass off. Um, so, just to give you a sense that this, these people really do get emotionally in, engaged in these things. And it really, it, 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 it really is a kind of personal experience. And you should see some of the comments uh, that we get from people. OK, so back to the arc of human history. Um, we have a lot of cooperative history behind us. And it seems like, at least in this country, that shared prosperity is not what it used to be. And the question is, you know, how, how are we going to start pulling it together as a country and return that sense of shared prosperity? Now, I've shown you a very micro example of this. This is a kind of proof of principle on the level of two individuals from across the, the, from across the divide. And so far, at least, it seems like it can work pretty well. And the big question is, how do you take that feeling of goodwill that comes from working together and having that shared benefit, and how do we, share, how do we scale that up so that it can save our country and other nations that are suffering under the kind of tribalism that is tearing us apart? So thanks very much, and looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Oh, and I forgot to thank my lab and Evan DeFilippis and Beyond Conflict for supporting this work. Thank <laughs> you.